My name is Elliot, and I'm a director of Garsdale Design Limited. We're a small family-run professional planning and architectural consultancy that specializes in Middle East city master planning. As you can see, we're not exactly a large multinational. Um, that's our office there. Uh, we're in a converted traditional Yorkshire Dales barn. Um, so there you go. It's not an office block, is it? So let's start with an outline of the presentation. Uh, apologies if it goes on a bit, but uh, I think in this presentation, I'm, I'm just going to stick to talking about the workflows and practices I know best, um, rather than talk to you about the academic theory behind them. Um, as I work in a small consultancy, we're concerned with a lot of practical things. For instance, managing our workflows, workloads and juggling our multiple roles as inevitably characterizes a small office. On a professional level, workflows are what really concern me. I'm interested in how we can extract value from our digital work and get from A to B. This is really a presentation about my journey. And until relatively recently, my whole perspective on how I work has been turned on its head. Um, so please, follow me through the journey I've taken. So there really are two types of workflow that take place in our office. Firstly, a main project workflow, which is linear and defi with defined start and end points. Um, often designated by the client and the project's terms of reference. Secondly, there are process workflows that are often the small iterative evaluations associated with particular tasks. These might be population modeling in spreadsheets, or at the detailed design stages, they include sketching and CAD work. We generally finish one phase of a project and use the outputs of that to inform the next stage. Ultimately, the smooth flow of data through our systems are critical. It's often when different types of work or data come together that it gets difficult. So let me start with the main work we do now and the workflows that we have been using. In my office, we undertake a variety of work from the very small single residential development up to region-wide structure plans. I think what we've learned recently is the question of scale and planning at the appropriate scale. And that's come off of yesterday's presentation, certainly. Um, but the projects that define and consumers at the moment are city master planning projects. Currently, these are in Iraq. As you can see from this slide, we have a fairly linear approach to the process. This is not only defined by the client and the contract, but is also how we would traditionally do many planning projects. Each stage in this example has a proper report and associated spreadsheet tables, writing, and of course, mapping. What many would see as the creative work is in the later phases, where we start designing urban areas, either at a strategic or detailed level. Sorry to all your spreadsheet power users out there. Um, I know you can get quite creative with it, but it, it really is the, the drawing elements that the, are where our creativity comes out. Um, our traditional workflows do work, but increasingly they are buckling under the weight of information we now have at our fingertips, thanks to the power of technology and, of course, GIS, as well as changing attitudes to data ownership. So sometimes the amount of incoming data for a project feels a bit like this. At the beginning of a project, there may be drought, but that quickly gives way to a torrent. <laughs> so ArcGIS is used to manage all our geographic data that comes from a variety of sources, householder surveys, old AutoCAD drawings, and often quite a lot of shape files that have been digitized from old paper maps. Difficulties such as data quality are inevitable with our diverse projects. Our Iraqi partners do amazing work translating Arabic data into English, but we still have some guesswork to do to extract the value of that work. So it's managing the changing nature of some of our data is one of the key challenges we face. So needless to say, cities don't stand still, politely waiting for our project to finish. It would be nice, but they just don't. <laughs> Especially in Iraq, where there's been a desperate need for infrastructure projects. It's a brave person who stands up and says, don't build that sewage treatment plant or road 
until the master plan is ready. Oh, and that'll take a couple of years. You just can't say that. So our work goes in tandem with the normal growth of a city, as well as major construction and infrastructure projects. This guarantees that our master plan is out of date before it is adopted. But don't worry, part of these projects is about training the Iraqi planning departments to manage our master plans, knowing how to update them. In a real sense, we teach them to think in terms of process rather than product. Our master plan is not a blueprint. So our clients in Iraq are mostly planners and politicians. Like in any country, they are educated, active, and eager to improve their cities, albeit in difficult, sometimes hostile environments. Have you ever been to a local planning committee meeting? They're fairly hostile environments, you know? So client requests are part of this process. As the project progresses and plans become more evolved, the planning teams in the cities involved send in requests for advice on certain sites to ensure compliance with the emerging master plan. The photos that you, you see here are a recent visit of our clients and Iraqi partners who came to the UK for training. And you can see two of our younger staff there, um, my daughters. <laughs> so all of our projects, of course, have deadlines. But the nature of development means that our approach has, to, has evolved to be flexible. We always expect changes, and inevitably, many occur just prior to submission. So right down at the end, right when you don't need them. Thru throughout our projects, we have always looked at ways to speed up our visual presentations. In terms of workload, they can take up quite a bit of time, but are re relatively low in importance when it comes to the actual analytical side of our work. 3D imagery has always been part of this visual mix, and clients get excited by it and have now come to expect such visualizations. Try handing in just a 2D map, and, and you're bound to get asked what it would look like in 3D anyway, so it's important. We've recently completed the Nazaria City Master Plan in Dikar province in south of Iraq, and are currently in the middle of preparing three master plans for cities in Wasit. In fact, I was work working on them prior to coming here. A bit of a, a bad time to come out on a conference right at the end of a particular phase, but there you go. Um, this means that we need to have a wide variety of visualizations produced towards the end of these projects. We produce a range of presentational materials to be included in the final report, including wall display maps and 3D visualizations. Our final ma city master plans also include a set of detailed studies in the final phases. These can be new neighborhood plans, linear development plans along major transport routes, or, for example, detailed urban renewal schemes for waterfronts. Most of our visualization work has a relatively simple but time-consuming workflow. Increasingly, though, clients want this sophisticated 3D visualizations in a variety of media, from the printed report to websites, video, and fully interactive walkthroughs. It's a big challenge for a small office, as you can appreciate. They do not just want to be told in words how to implement the master plan. They want to see it. They want to feel how it would be to walk around it. Um, and it's a perfectly understandable. After all, most of these plans are going to be subject to consultation by the general public who don't necessarily have a background in reading maps, for instance. So have we done such visualizations in the past? Well, we sketch them. We scan and georeference. We digitize them in AutoCAD or ArcGIS. Um, it feels like pretty antiquated when I stand up here in front of you lot saying this. but. Uh, Import it into SketchUp. Yeah, we still use SketchUp. Um, we also import it into some rendering software when we want to make it extra, extra pretty. So the different methods and workflows of producing these visualizations add to the time scales just at the point when we need them to be completed really quickly. We've always used a combination of professional software packages to produce our 3D visualizations. We have always use traditional hand-drawn images, but then increasingly sketch up and for presentational material, these all take in incredible amounts of times to complete in-house. What we have never done before is produce a complete 3D model of a whole neighborhood, let alone a city, because such a task seemed to be just too time-consuming. Conventional professional 3D modeling packages are good and can do this, but they require too much of our time and effort for anything more than visualizing small sections or details of our master plans. So 
after some research a couple of years back, after getting fed up of working with SketchUp for several days on a, an area, um, I looked at ways of trying to tackle the issues that we've been discovering. Um, and we came across a, an interesting software tool called City Engine. The first license I got for it, um, I got a discount because I liked it on Facebook. So it's pre Esri. <laughs> yeah? So, an idea for the future, Jack, maybe? <laughs> so, it, it showed us promise purely because it worked with a variety of formats. So, I thought it could fit in with our AutoCAD, ArcGIS, and sort of SketchUp workflows. I really thought th this could work. I saw the import export capabilities of it. Um, in the beginning, we used real data from a project and essentially experimented with it. But from the moment I started using it, it became apparent this procedural modeler would not only save us huge amounts of time in, produ of, in producing the 3D visualizations, it had the potential to totally, totally change the way we think about our own workflows. So this is the exciting bit. Now, what I'm doing with it now, what, uh, what I've left in the UK to come and talk to you about now, as I'm finally using City Engine in anger and in the way I've, I've wanted to use it, not just in sort of experimental stages. We're combining 3D work in SketchUp with some of the models in City Engine. As you can see, the time taken to model urban areas has dramatically Im increased. This model, it's a real model, it took us four days in SketchUp for the same project, four days for a neighborhood center, or and that was done by my father, and the one on the right, that was done in half a day in City Engine. And that's a whole city quarter. Now, there's a lot of work gone into that with the rule files, but that was from previous experimentation, so actually the, the work gets quicker the more data you have, the more rule files you have about it. So yeah, a lot of work is up front, but eventually it gets quicker and quicker. I mean, it really has been incredibly dramatic. I mean, these, we know how it, long it takes to do it in SketchUp, and it's, it's changed us. We're now looking to combine, you know, the, the models we've already made in previous projects and shove them into new master plan models. So all the assets we've built over time, they're still usable. We're still using them today. And, and City Engine hasn't changed that. It's just allowed us to do more with it. The other tool we've been using um, is a real-time rendering package. We're using Lumion at present. While secondary to the modeling, Lumion pr improves the quality of imagery we produce, and we're no, no longer waiting overnight to see some of the results of those renderings. So the imagery is quite nice. It's not necessarily photorealistic, but in urban planning and master planning projects, you don't necessarily need that. So I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has been on a project where changes are needed just prior to finishing the project. Yeah, right at the last minute, something comes along, we've missed it. This slide shows what can happen on a project. They build a bridge without telling us. <laughs> yeah? There's a bit more of a story to it, but this can happen. Things like this happen. Um, we're discovering at the detailed design stages that City Engine can allow us to make quick changes to the detail plan, such as a new road, and give us a corresponding 3D model. This sort of change would have taken significant time just for a visualization a, a, a few months, or even a, you know, a few weeks ago, but in City Engine, you can do it in a day. So the turnaround has is, is improved. Well, I've got ideas for City Engine, and some of the City Engine folk, if if they forgive me, please, uh, <laughs> I've been bending their ear about it for a while now. Um, our next job is an urban renewal project, which will require much more detail than the relatively simple level of detail we have used in our master planning work. City Engine seems to us, at any rate, to be able to model at a macro and micro planning levels. It's a question of imagination. But while I'm not involved in the development of City Engine's tools, I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be more capabilities developed for it. I've been working with ways of letting the rule files create its own data instead of responding to the 2D data. So a lot of the demonstrations you see are taking value from the 2D assets you have. What I want to see is City Engine create rather than just take. So by that, I mean 
for instance, choosing points within a city and varying the model depending on its distance from that point. The beauty here is I can have multiple points. Could I really use City Engine to distribute neighborhood centers based on variables I give it? We'll have to see. I mean, the, the common thread is we do a lot of planning standards in Excel, and I want to be able to convert those fairly simplistic rules and standards and put it into a tool like City Engine, and it does it for me. It's path of least resistance. Call me lazy. <laughs> so, but in, until then, try not to think of City Engine as just being about cities. It has much more potential. I've already looked at how it might help respond to soils and relief in a forestry model, so why not other areas as well? This is a quick model I did based on a height of trees and mix of ages of trees on um, some open data that I got in the UK. And there's some wind turbines in the distance just to give it a bit of edge. Um, so finally, I come to this term, geodesign. I've, I've been wary of using the term in this presentation. For one thing, it didn't feature on my university courses. So I don't know at first hand how it's regarded academically. Yeah? The other reason is I believe a lot of us have been doing geodesign for some time, but never explicitly using the term geodesign to describe it. When I was invited to be featured speaker, I thought I'd better read up on the geodesign term. And one of the things I read was linked to from this summit's website, Changing Geography by Design. One particular phrase that stood out for me was, the sketch is key to geodesign. And you can see a lot of our work has been about the detailed design. That's where we get excited, not the sort of strategic broad view, but some of the details. We like that. And in some respects, I'm going to have to worry about this. If the key to geodesign is sketching, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. You see, I can't draw. No, really, I'm quite good at tracing. <laughs> and give me a coloring book. I'm reasonable. I'm reasonable at at colouring, but sketching and drawing, well, I'm not an artist. My three-year-old daughter is, but not me. Both of my fellow directors, I call them mum and dad, <laughs> can draw. They can draw. They're architects by training. Um, not only that, they have at least 30-plus years of design experience, as well as being used to work without computers. Yes, there are people out there that have not learned computers from the start of their lives. So... Is it going to be back to the old drawing board for me? Well, for all my colleagues' artistic talent, today's projects use only a fraction of that. We're increasingly reliant on vast amounts of facts and figures, as well as new theories and models. The sheer amount of data we now have to take into account can overwhelm the design stages. So the design process has been forced from pen and paper onto the computer. From my colleagues' generation, design on computer is not a natural process. So what happens is this. They draw the designs, and I scan them, georeference, and trace their designs into GIS. It sounds familiar to what uh, has been talked about already. It's, it's, a, it's lucky I'm good at tracing, I guess. You know? As I see it, the future of geodesign and the emergence of devices like tablets will allow people who are good at sketching to get back to the pure design. Designers will know what they do is constantly being informed by underlying data and, what, and that if key assumptions changes, the designs can still be used within a new model. I suspect I shouldn't have been worried about the, my lack of design expertise. Maybe a geodesign program could well be created that will make it look like I can draw. Until people create that geodesigner, my strength is in systems, workflows and technologies. Theirs is in their ability to conceptualize and ultimately produce a good design. So my hope is that in the near future, we will be able to have a natural, almost effortless approach to design. This should look as natural as my daughter is doing here. But actually, we're harnessing huge amounts of data and knowledge as we do so. In fact, just like we already do, but on a bigger and better scale. So this is my big idea. <laughs> because our workflows are going to change radically in the next few years. Look at what City Engine has done for one of our workflows. It has already cut the time spent creating a model by more than half and allowed us to keep our 3D modeling in-house. 
It will only get quicker as our stock of rule files increases and the software development moves on. It started with me wondering what a really exciting demonstration of our skills and the power of City Engine would look like in the future. Such a demonstration would show how the use of a tool like City Engine can inform at all stages of a master planning process, even from the outset. This sounds strange, but at present we start with background studies, involve that into a number of growth options for a city, and from that the client chooses. This happens over months, if not years. The problem with this approach is that early on the client chooses the direction of growth. But what if the situation changes? That's something that's bigger than just a bridge. It's going to be costly and timely to start again. What I envisage happening in the future is that tools like City Engine and the concepts of geodesign can be harnessed together. This will allow multiple versions of a city master plan to go through all at the same time. Then the client could choose at the end, a process, end of the process, a complete city plan, knowing all of its implications from building information modeling to any other measurable indicator. So they have a, a, a true choice at, the, at every sense of the word. So essentially, you could start with a blank sheet knowing how many people you need to plan for and a default set of planning standards based on the country or region the project is in. As the project progresses and more information is delivered, existing roads, terrain, or land uses, for example, and as each data layer is imported into the GIS, the city engine rules you have created run over it again and within your defined parameters, remake the proposed city or growth area. As our ideas are formulated, new planning policies can be created that are fed into the rule files so that a very specific model for the area is created to show what the resulting urban fabric would look like. For example, you could take solar data and use that for the basis of orientating buildings in the master plan. So with a clever rule, whole buildings could be orientated automatically depending on the location in relation to the sun, even in a valley. I already do this for visualizations with details such as satellite dishes on roofs, and mosques that need correct orientation on a city-wide level. I mean, you, you take the model and you just adjust the slider bar and whole buildings across your city move and individual assets on your, on your roofs. So it's in incredibly simple once you've, you've programmed it into the rule file. I think the problem with this concept is that it's simple, but it requires a lot of computing power. However, I think we're approaching now a time when computing power is a product of how many is a product of how many sh machines in the cloud you can afford to have working on the problem. The instant city idea relies on a cloud computing or a very powerful computer to make it a reality. What I envisage is a large visual display at a geo conference and many tablets available. Attendees could contribute to the design process of a city by adding data, satellite imagery, obstacle maps, roads, etc. As each layer was placed in the model, City Engine would update the city model and GIS would in turn update its analysis, pie graphs etc. All in real time. This is a very much a formative idea at the moment and we need a lot of development. Nevertheless, it would be a great experiment and show off in real time some of the geodesign concepts in practice and sort of provide a focus for, for different pro professions to come in and share their ideas. So I have some thoughts. They're, they're just bullet points really, but there's, there's a number of issues that have come out of me looking at City Engine and what, what future uses we could have for it. Um, one of the key issues I, I see at the moment is the sheer amount of information we all have access to now. I, mean, I can get thousands and thousands of uh, Excel spreadsheets of the minutest detail of my council's you know, spending program. And, and how are we going to interpret that? We haven't got the skills, we haven't got the time, the professionals are doing other things, and the public don't have those tools available. Well, we're seeing GIS software is getting easier and cheaper, open source development, um, cloud computing. So I, I think that those two are going to converge and, and help one another. Um, when I talk about sketching as being sort of a fluid and, and natural process, I'm trying to tie in some ideas of haptic feedback. So you have a pen that gets heavier to draw across a, a particular relief. So you're, you, you know in the, in the database that drawing a road on a steep hill is probably a 
not a good idea, unless you're in San Francisco, probably. Um, but it would get heavier. Be a, there would be some kind of feedback back from that to inform the designer that you are doing something that has a cost. But no visuals. It, it's just sort of slight feedbacks and pushing you in the right direction. Um, there's some gamification ideas. Um, and I, I've got to thank James Fee for a blog post on uh, Minecraft he did recently, which is the, uh, the, the playground there, you see. But it sounds like I'm trivializing this idea, but there is costs involved in designing things. And if you can have that feedback, whether it be haptic or, or, or some numbers, every time you digitize a point, there's a cost. And if you have a slight reminder on the screen when you're digitizing, as a designer, I think that's going to be hugely helpful. So not so much competing against each other, but competing against the set of goals that you have in place. Um, large rollable displays. It's something I've been hoping for for ages, and it, it might be just around the corner, just next week, maybe. Um, I've seen the process of some of the geodesign um, elements where you get out a pen and you project your map onto a, uh, a table and, and you start drawing, but it's using a Wii controller. It seems to be sort of a, a cobbled together solution or you have to buy very expensive uh, computer Wacom tablet screens um, to do it. But what I'd like to see is uh, some more natural technologies come through. So you just come into a meeting and you, you unroll a map and everyone knows that you put a map in front of people and they start talking. But if you can let them draw on it, that's even better. And if I don't have to trace it, again, <laughs> I'm lazy. What can I say? Um, but all of, this, all of these ideas really rely on... on, on some pretty essential technology, some really basic stuff, internet connections. And it, it's a bit of a, an issue for us at the moment in that we are, in a, we are based in a rural area and our DSL speeds are good enough for watching movies. BBC, great. But when you start wanting to contribute to the discussion, when you want to participate in conferences or when you want to upload the data that we've created. We're still having to put some of those on DVDs and send them or leave it uploading overnight. You know, we've got seven megabytes down, but we've got half a megabyte up. I mean, there's a real consequence at the last minute. We've always got, we could use those two days. If we had instant upload speeds, we might, we, we'll buy ourselves some more time and we can do some more exciting things with it. So, are any of what I had, my instant city idea. Is it impossible? Well, if you told me some, like last week or a couple of weeks back, um, you could build a 30-story skyscraper in 15 days a month ago, well, I might have given you an odd look. But they're doing it. There's people out there in China building an incomplete tower block in a factory and then coming out on site, and in 15 days, they've got themselves a a high-rise building, and I don't know if any of you have seen the, some of the YouTube videos of this, actual time-lapse photography, and, and they're, looking at, they're, looking at, they're looking at building it in three months. I mean, so when we talk about impossibilities, we really have to look at other industries and see what they're doing, because I don't think anything's particularly impossible anymore. I haven't done any exciting demonstrations, but I do have this video at the end. Um, it's speeded up, but it is half a day's work. Um, I apologize for some of the, the grainy elements to it. I didn't realize it was going to be projected on such a big screen. Um, my office is <laughs> it's not that tall, so. <laughs> right, so this is what it feels like for me after working with SketchUp and then doing it this way. Um, <laughs> that's a utility network. I'm putting in some pylons. And it's super quick. And it's just a question of writing the right rule file, really. Um, I'm going to have a look at some a generic office block, building up the model. Uh, you can change all the variables in it. Satellite dishes, trams, we can put them, move them along the track. Here's a car park. Do you want occupancy rates? You know. <laughs> and you can change the minutest detail in that model. You can look at an individual building. 
and set the streets up. So you can really, it's all about scale. You can, that's the power of City Engine as I see it. The, the, the different scales you can work at are pretty incredible. And the bridge. <laughs> you know, this, this, is, this is where it comes in, into its own, when you're changing the different types of support structure. So, we're going back again. We're repeating it. You don't want to see it again. 